Hi everybody, it's Christine and Dr. Bob again. Mm -hmm. Hi. In our last conversation we were talking about active listening and after we um, turned off the video we continued to have a conversation and realized that it might be valuable to have active listening part two. <laughs> I, I'm going to dive in and I'm going to ask Christine to, to share wherever you want to go. I'm aware of in my work over the years uh, counseling and coaching with um, people who are recovering from addiction is that oftentimes what I've used uh, uh, to introduce the work that I can bring to their, their recovery program is to focus on two things. Uh, one is on emotions, what's going on emotionally for them, and the second is relationship, what's going on in their relationships. It ties very much into our talking about active listening. Uh, as Christine and I were talking later after the previous video, uh, I don't know that I've ever worked with a client who was uh, uh, in the process of recovery from addiction who didn't have um, at the core of it, in addition to biological aspects, like we were talking about genetic vulnerability, didn't have significant relational concerns in terms of feeling heard we talked about active listening in terms of feeling actively listened to, um, that it's so much a part of what what maybe initiates and sustains addiction that it doesn't make sense to ignore it. So I thought we might talk about that for a couple of minutes, just talk about listening, relationship, and uh, maybe even genetics, I don't know if we can talk about that. So let's just, let's just see where we go for maybe like no, I, I think you're exactly right. I think there has to be some kind of driver to it mm -hmm. um, yeah. to, want, to get them to want to even try or to try something such as um, alcohol or yeah. uh, another kind of drug yeah. um, or in other uh, negative Ways yeah. to, to act out to do something. Yeah, there's plenty of plenty of addictions besides substance for sure. Exactly. Somebody calls those process addictions, things that uh, gambling, sex. In fact, uh, one author I like a lot says we're all addicted to thought. We just think obsessively. That and it's no one even questions that. That's no less of an addiction. If I can't stop thinking, it's worth questioning whether that's not an addiction. It also goes back to your beginners. Curiosity, mm -hmm. where you're looking at it in a different way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hopefully, hopefully, yeah. There's a piece of what you just said about oh, about uh, we were talking about triggers, about how it is something that will uh, trigger somebody's turning to substance, let's say, or to another addictive behavior. Um, in genetics, it's clear that some of us are more genetically vulnerable to addiction. Let's say there's too much research to indicate that that you know twin double blind twin studies where you see that, that genetics play a part in one's vulnerability to uh, alcohol, let's say, as an example. Yet also what's clear from the research in neurobiology is that uh, genetics aren't sufficient. It may be necessary, uh, uh, let me put this, it may be necessary to include it in some kind of formula of understanding addiction, but that it's not uh, complete or sufficient to explain addiction because the environment has uh, as much to do with that. And the way the geneticists talk about this, I was just sharing with Christine, I can't remember the exact term, but I'm going to use the word trigger, is that I may have a genetic predisposition, you may have a genetic predisposition for a certain kind of addictive behavior, let's say, that might or might not be triggered by our environment. Let's say that you grow up, let's say that we're twins at birth, we're separated. You grow up in a very warm, facilitative, empathic, nurturing environment. Let's say I, I grew up in the opposite of that. Whatever the opposite would be, that's what I grew up in. We have the identical genetics owing to the fact that we're twins. Um, she ends up not developing alcoholism. I do. You have to factor in the environment at that point. That's so much of the, the work that I think we as counselors do is trying to get at that X factor. We can't really change somebody's genetics, but what we can begin to do is to address trauma that they've, that they've encountered or neglect that they've encountered, including currently uh, with the hope of changing that, so that that what we seek, uh, what did one author call it, that addiction is a poor form substitute for intimacy. It, it's kind of back to the Twinkie theory, is that if somebody, if, if all of us really seek engagement or connection, what psychologists call attachment, and I can't find that, then I have to find something to fill that vacuum. And for a lot of people, it's a substance or an addictive behavior. And so... That's the core of the work, I think, is addressing that. And that's why I say addressing emotions that are going on inside that may need to be expressed and haven't felt like a safe place to express. And then also relationships. S let's face it, some relationships suck. 
<laughs> they need serious work if they're going to be helpful. And the individual's addiction is part and parcel of the sucky relationship. That's the technical term. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.